So it's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome a friend of mine named Peter Sokolowski, who's an editor at Merriam-Webster, to talk to us. And uh, Peter joined Merriam-Webster in 1994. He was the first French language editor. Uh, he writes definitions for many dictionaries, the Merriam-Webster products. Uh, he also does a lot of blog articles, podcasts, and uh, videos and talks like this. Um, he's been published in quite a few uh, venues you might recognize, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Slate. Uh, he's frequent radio and television guest. He's am among Time's 140 best Twitter feeds of 2013. Um, he has lots of uh, workshops on dictionaries in English for the State Department. And uh, he shares with me a, a, a unique sort of role. He's the pronouncer for many spelling bees, but he's sort of the international branch. Uh, and Peter attended the University of Paris and earned his MA in French literature at the University of Massachusetts. He's a freelance musician and a music host at New England Public Radio. So uh, I've heard him talk. I think we'll have a wonderful, enjoyable evening tonight and uh, stick around afterwards to ask some questions. Also, I should thank our sponsors. We have the Department of Classics, the Department of English, the Department of Romance Languages and Culture, and let me make sure I get it right, the, the Complex System Center of Vermont, is that the official title? Um, I hope, and they have the Roboctopus on the, uh, on the uh, poster, which is quite a wonderful logo. <laughs> so Peter is the host of the meeting and I'll just hand it over to him and uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Jacques, and it's a treat to see you. We've, we missed the spelling bee this year. So before I share my screen, I'll just you know, say that uh, it's one of my pleasures to, to uh, go to the National Spelling Bee every year and, and sort of participate, partly because the, in a way, the dictionary is the rule book for the spelling bee. Um, as, as Jacques has said, it's the speller against the dictionary. Um, and so traditionally there had been a representative of Merriam-Webster, which is the official dictionary um, at the bee. And that person had been a, a, you know, like a marketing person or someone just to represent the company. But when I started going, I. I just stuck my nose into the language end a little bit more because it's, you know, as a lexicographer, I felt like there was so much to say about the definitions, about the pronunciations, about the phonetics, and uh, working with and watching Jacques work has been a terrific privilege and pleasure. And yes, we could talk about, um, at the end, we'll talk about the difference between pronouncing for an international B for non-native speakers of English as opposed to pronouncing for the National Spelling Bee, which obviously Jacques does, as opposed to another thing I do quite frequently, which maybe Jacques doesn't do quite so much, but you do a little bit of, which is a, a, an adult spelling bee. To me, that's a third category of a, a very different kind of animal. But we'll, we'll, I'm gonna share my screen and we can, we can start. Um, let's share this and I hope uh, that you can see this and we'll go to my, click it from beginning and there we go. So you can all see the little book there. Looks good. Okay, and I don't know, um, Jacques, if, if there's anyone else um, who's hosting, because I can't necessarily monitor new, uh, new arrivals uh, at this point. So is there, any, is, is there someone, oh, I, hang on, maybe I can. Because um, I just want to make sure everyone can get in. I just admitted a few more. <laughs> um, is, it, is there someone else with admission privileges? No, I'm afraid it's you, Peter. Okay, so when I see that, if it pops up again, um, they, I, I, that's fine, I'll, but you'll see me um, click and admit them, but that's no problem at all. Anyway, we're gonna start, oh yeah, okay, it pops up, which is good. So I, I don't wanna make people wait, you know, and sit, sit in a waiting room, in a digital waiting room. Um, we're gonna talk very briefly uh, about dictionaries today. I mean, my basic question that I, I wanna answer is what makes a person look up a word? And very often when people ask, uh, lexicographers to speak, they want to know how dictionaries are written and the background of that and the history of that. And, and of course, we could talk all day about that. And that's an interesting subject. But I have found sometimes it's interesting to think about how dictionaries are read or how they're used. Um, with a group like this, I often ask, you know, how many of you at home find yourselves actually literally reading the dictionary? And I bet that's true for a lot of us. Um, I think in some ways, there's probably two kinds of people in the world or people who read the dictionary and, and people who don't. And uh, the fact is, a lot of us who do that think that we're alone in doing that. Uh, I am, 
when I attend conferences, very frequently someone will come up to me and say, you know, my whole family thinks I'm insane because I read the dictionary, you know, uh, and almost always they think that they're telling me this for the first time. And yet I've heard this story dozens or hundreds of times. And so we're not alone, people like us uh, who are fascinated by language and who are attracted to dictionaries in different ways for different reasons. But one thing that we can now measure, which was never true before in the 400 odd years of monolingual dictionaries in English, is actually sort of measuring and registering and understanding uh, which words are being looked up, when they're being looked up, and maybe, just maybe, why. And we can start with a couple of anecdotes. Let's see if, I, if I can um, get my little screen to move. There we go. With a couple of anecdotes. Uh, one going back to 1755. This is Samuel Johnson. Many of you will know his name, uh, the, uh, the lexicographer in London, who uh, is the author of what many people consider to be the first modern dictionary of English. Um, a great monolingual dictionary. We could go on for a long time about the, the great work of Samuel Johnson, who was also a poet and a writer and a critic. Um, and uh, when Johnson's dictionary was published in 1755, he was congratulated by uh, a matron of London society who said, I'm so pleased that you have omitted the naughty words. Uh, to which Dr. Johnson is supposed to have replied, Madam, I find that you have been looking them up which of course had to be true because how else would someone know that the word wasn't in a dictionary unless they were looking for it? So to me, this is good early evidence of what we now call a lookup of the curiosity that sends you to the dictionary. There's another story, um, there's another story that um, uh, is uh, around the making of the Oxford English Dictionary, the great project that was uh, underway around 1900. And this was the first editor of the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, James Murray was his name. And as you probably know, uh, at Oxford, uh, the editors of the OED um, actually consulted with the faculty at Oxford University uh, as experts. And so there was a new word that was submitted to the dictionary and um, it was a medical word. And they asked the medical faculty, should we add this word to the new English dictionary that we are, that we are uh, compiling? And the answer came back, no, that we shouldn't add this word. You shouldn't because it's too specialized, it's too abstruse. Only a medical surgical specialist needs to use this, use this word. Uh, and I think that shows maybe a little prejudice about what a dictionary is and what a dictionary isn't. And that's, again, maybe a different subject for a different day. But I think a lot of people thought at that time that dictionaries really f were for literature um, and not for the technical or professional language that, uh, that we also think of today as being part of dictionaries. But at any rate, they didn't add the word. And then the single biggest story of the brand new 20th century in 1901 took place, which was the death of the queen. Queen Victoria died. And then her son would become king and they scheduled the coronation. But then the Prince of Wales, her son, became ill. In fact, he became seriously ill. In fact, he became mortally ill. And the entire nation was riveted to this story. They delayed the coronation uh, of the health of the new king of England, and everyone wanted to know about his condition. Unfortunately, the name of his condition was the word that was dropped by the editor at the request of the medical faculty at Oxford, and so no one could look it up. It's another occasion of people curious about a word that was not in the dictionary. The word was appendicitis. Um, and so we can now move on to the kind of modern times and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. We went online and put our dictionary online for free in 1996. Um, and to give a little background, just a little background about uh, Merriam-Webster dictionaries and our tradition, uh, Noah Webster, uh, who is uh, in this portrait, who looks like money in this picture, uh, was uh, a scholar and a, a lawyer and a teacher, an educator, um, and a publisher and a lexicographer. He was born in 1758, and that means he turned 18 in 1776. And I think what you're passionate about when you're 18 is probably important for the rest of your life. And he was passionate about the American political experiment. He knew Benjamin Franklin and George Washington personally. He was present in Philadelphia, not as a delegate, but he was at the Constitutional Convention. He was a very political person. He was a member of the Federalist Party who worked with George Washington for the passage 
of, uh, of the Constitution. So there was a lot, of, a lot to uh, Webster. But one thing that he did also was make a dictionary, the dictionary that we all know today. In many ways, it was the first uh, American dictionary. He's the reason, by the way, that we spell words differently from the British. Uh, if you ever thought about the difference, differences between British English and American English, we can blame Webster for the, the fact that we don't um, have a U in words like color and honor and humor, or that we spell um, inflections of verbs uh, with a single consonant rather than two. So we say canceled or traveled with one L rather than the British tradition with two, or the words like theater and center with ER rather than the French RE. Words like mask with a K instead of Q-U-E. Words like music and public without a terminal K. Um, Webster hated silent letters. He also hated double letters. So all of these prejudices came into play. Webster really had two goals. He wanted to create a, 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 a patriotic American variety of the English language. And he wanted to make a more logical uh, spelling system for the English language. And I think we can all agree that he succeeded in creating an American variety of English. And I think we can say that he failed in creating a more logical way to spell English, because as you all know, uh, we're all responsible essentially for two systems now rather than one. And there's nothing much more phonetic about American English. Uh, and that's part of the, the magic and mystery and the difficulties of the English language is that, uh, that it's, uh, its phonetics don't match its orthography. That's why we have spelling bees in English and not in Hindi or Spanish or, or, or Korean. Now, Webster was a good scholar and he wrote his dictionary. He was not a good businessman. He charged $20 for his dictionary in 1828. $20 in 1828 could buy you this grandfather clock. Um, and that shows you that this was a luxury item, not a household item the way we think of a dictionary today. And so when he died, uh, first of all, it has to be said, he, like almost everyone else involved in dictionaries, did not become rich. Uh, and uh, he had dictionaries left over at his death. And those dictionaries were sold by a printing company in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, that was owned by George and Charles Merriam, the Merriam brothers, who were printers. And once they sold out of uh, Webster's old copies, they decided to retypeset the dictionary into a single volume and to set the price. You'll see at the top of this advertisement from 1847, $6. So they reduced the price from $20 to $6. And in a kind of a great American business story, they turned wide distribution at a low price into a profit. Um, uh, making their money through volume. And that's a kind of classic American uh, model, and that's one that we'll see uh, as, we, as we go on tonight. Um, they invented this abridgment called the, pardon me, called the Collegiate Dictionary. Many, many of you have heard of the Collegiate. Many of you probably own one. Today it's red. Uh, and the Collegiate Dictionary is the standard um, dictionary for American book and magazine publishing and for academic use. Um, and uh, it, it cost in 1898, $3. Um, we invented the little paperback dictionary, 1947. This cost 35 cents on sale, it cost 25 cents. Now, uh, in terms of mass distribution of a product, um, from 25 cents is really only one place to go, and that is completely free. So when we put our dictionary online in 1996, this was the first homepage and it was free. You'll see in those days, some of you will remember everything was www this and www that. And we thought if you look up here on the, on the left, it says www Webster, which we thought might catch on, it didn't. Um, but you could click on that button and you would find the dictionary that uh, you could look up words online. But you'll see here, there was an online bookstore. Uh, we saw that the, the sales of books actually increased for a few years after we put this dictionary online for free. Um, clearly, people used it at the office and then remembered the brand in the bookstore when they were buying gifts or whatever. Um, but this is how the dictionary looked. And then for the first time at Merriam-Webster, we were able to see as data which words people were looking up. And initially, the, the list was static. And it kind of looked like a, a vocabulary list, like an SAT study list. And it wasn't that interesting. And we really didn't know what to do with it until another big news event happened. And, and coincidentally, it also had to do with the royal family. In 1997, the death of Princess Diana was maybe the first news story worldwide that was widely shared online. And uh, people were riveted to this story. It was a massively important uh, news event, needless to say. This is a picture of Kensington Palace, uh, Princess Diana's residence 
uh, after her death. And then we immediately saw the words in our dictionary changed and they changed dramatically and they told a story. We saw that the word paparazzi, which was the cause of her death, she was being chased by photographers, uh, was looked up. And then after her funeral, the word cortege. And then finally, and maybe more, more puzzlingly, the word princess was looked up. And princess is a word that maybe all of us are familiar with and not a word that we would look up in the dictionary. Let's just look very quickly at these three words. First of all, paparazzi is a classic spelling problem. Are there two P's? Are there two Z's? Um, what's the singular? Um, I, bet, I bet every newsroom in America was looking up the word paparazzi and they sent the word up to the top of our list. The word cortege, like a lot of modern French borrowings, is pronounced in the French manner and is probably confusing to a lot of English speakers. Um, and so maybe that's the reason people were looking it up. And the word princess is different. Uh, this is a basic word in our vocabulary. Most American adults would be familiar with this word. It's not really tough to spell either. However, there are many questions about this word that might have come up at that time. For example, are you born a princess? Is a princess uh, automatically um, uh, be, uh, is a princess automatically made a queen at a certain point? Um, can a, does a princess remain a princess after a divorce, which was relevant in this story? Um, is a princess higher than a duchess? I mean, there's lots of questions that you could answer from a dictionary definition. These are questions that I would call encyclopedic questions. These are questions about the phenomenon of a princess rather than the lexical issue, the spelling or the meaning or the pronunciation. And yet those are questions that can be answered from a dictionary. And this kind of uh, uh, curiosity is something we are gonna see again and again. Now, 9-11, needless to say, an enormous news story, and also the words tell a story. The first words looked up in the first days were concrete words of destruction and, uh, and medical response, words like rubble and triage. The subsequent words were looked up, uh, were words of sort of shock and response of, of, on the part of the public, words like succumb and surreal. Uh, and finally, uh, after about four or five days, more political and analytical words that were used in the news, words like terrorism, and jingoism often used as a kind of response to terrorism. And the number one word looked up after 9-11 was the word surreal. And um, as a, as a card-carrying lexicographer, when I see that this word is looked up, I say to myself, I hope it's a good definition. I mean, I hope the definition isn't of or relating to surrealism, uh, that, that this is the kind of helpful definition. And it turns out this definition is a good one, marked by the intense irrational reality of a dream marked by the intense irrational reality of a dream. And this is a good definition in lots of ways. And I'm just gonna draw your attention to a couple of those ways right now. First of all, it reads almost as if it was written for 9-11, it wasn't. Um, and there are a couple important words in this definition. And, and maybe we all take definitions for granted and that's okay because a dictionary is a kind of a utilitarian product in many ways, but it's also a product of human labor and, and intellect and, 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 and judgment. And in this case, for example, the word reality is there. And the word surreal, etymologically, um, we'll, we'll get into the classics a little bit. Surreal, the Latin part, sur meaning, meaning over or above, more than real, super real, extra real. Um, and that's where the word reality comes in into this definition, but also the word dream in this definition. Because surrealism is the origin of the word surreal. And surrealism is, the, of course, the artistic movement of the early 20th century. Think of artists like Dali or Magritte. And what were they doing? This was a modern expression of the, the unconscious life that was, in many ways, expounded upon by Sigmund Freud in the late 19th and early 20th century. And think of those, those paintings. They are literally dreamscapes. They were pictures of the unconscious. They were dreams. Uh, that were expressed in art. And that's why uh, a definition like this can be kind of short and sweet, and yet it connects the, the word itself to its etymology, to its deeper meaning, to its own connection with itself, with its own origin. Um, and by the way, I mean, I, I noticed this word succumb. Succumb was also there, and succumb, uh, it, 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 it happens to be on my mind today because like the word incumbent, which is one of the most looked up words today, it comes from, uh, from the Latin word meaning to lie down, right? And succumb uh, meaning to lie down, incumbent, um, you know, the one in office. Um, and so uh, it's an interesting etymological relationship there. Michael Jackson's death was a huge story uh, in the news and enormously uh, important in vocabulary terms. The words stricken, resuscitate, RIP, 
Um, the word icon was used in almost every obituary. Sometimes there is the dog that does not bark. Uh, for example, the word moonwalk is in our dictionary as both a noun and a verb, and yet it did not spike. And yet it was often used in the obituaries. And this is an important point. I think if you are reading Michael Jackson's obituary in the New York Times, you're probably very familiar with what the moonwalk is and was. And yet the word emaciated, which became the most looked up word of that week uh, in June or July of 2009, the number one word of the entire summer, the number two looked up word and raw tonnage of the entire year of 2009 was the word emaciated. And in this case, I think there's something of a cognitive dissonance. I think a lot of American adults were familiar with this word in the context of, say, starvation in the developing world, but not in the context of the most famous pop star in the world. And so when the reported condition of Michael Jackson's body was emaciated, people looked up that word. And this gets us to a big major reason that people go to the dictionary, especially for words with Greek or Latin roots. They seem, they seem technical, they seem legal, they seem medical. There's a specificity about this word in the context of the, uh, the coroner's report of Michael Jackson that simply isn't there when you're talking about a general news story. And that kind of specificity sends people to the dictionary. <clears throat> but in a way we can forget all that. English is difficult, English is hard. It's not just the news that sends people to the dictionary. It's confusing words like these, affect and effect, which are enormously problematic for speakers of English and were for the first um, uh, you know, 15 years of our dictionary online among the most looked up words every single day, day in and day out. Um, and that's because we have trouble with these words. And, and that's because um, like so many other words in, um, in the English language, like just think of further and farther or platoon and peloton, uh, words that are etymologically related, that are twins in certain ways and that have split at one point in their history and that we tend to use in different ways. And that's a sort of cruel trick that English plays on people. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, it just so happens that these two words are both pronounced with a schwa in the initial syllable. Um, I usually pronounce them affect and effect in lectures just to tell them apart. Um, but they're both nouns, they're both verbs. It's very confusing. These words are the bread and butter of the dictionary. Um, but also the basic vocabulary words that people look up um, look like this. Notice something pragmatic, paradigm, integrity. These are almost all words with classical roots, once again, um, to connect to the etymology. And what, what, is it, uh, what is it about English words with classical roots? Uh, I think it's important to remember they nearly always are more abstract than words with Anglo-Saxon or Old English roots. Isn't that true? A word like door, a word like girl, uh, a word like um, a horse. These, these good old fashioned Anglo-Saxon terms, they tend to be concrete nouns. Um, and of course, all the function words and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the function verbs as well. Um, but these, these Greek and Latin words like integrity or pragmatic, these tend to be much, or democratic for that matter, and they tend to be much more abstract and tend to require a lot more thought and definition. Um, and therefore, they send people to the dictionary. These are the words that pay our salaries. These are the words that people come to the dictionary for day in and day out. Now, some words are looked up, not according to the news, uh, or according to the difficulties of the English language, but according to the calendar. In the first two weeks of February, every single year, like clockwork, the number one word pinged in our data is the word love. And I don't think it's for spelling. Now, I do, I do think that there are many reasons that people go to the dictionary, and I always say that we're good at reading data. We're not good at reading minds. However, we do have some clue about the word love because people write to us. People write to the dictionary. We get letters. Now they're mostly emails, but it used to be we get maybe 100 letters a month and we answer all of them. And here's the answer to one letter that gives us a clue about this word. We thank you for your letter, but your question about how long love lasts is not something we can answer. We lexicographers are good at defining words. Questions about the nature and permanence of deeply felt human emotions, though, are a little outside our field. We're sorry not to be more helpful. And it is funny, but it's also completely earnest and honest. It's the kind of response that you get when, that, when you reach the edge of our expertise. But there's something I would share with you that is not shared in this letter. And that is that we draw a line, a very fine line, but a very important line, a philosophical line maybe, between the lexical and what is a phenomenon. 
In other words, we can define the word love, but we cannot define the phenomenon or the feeling or the experience of love. We can't tell you what it feels like or how long it will last, but we can tell you the company it keeps on the page. We can tell you the, the syntax. We can tell you the usage. Uh, we, can, we can tell you the history. So that distinction between the lexical and the encyclopedic and is a slightly different one. The encyclopedic is something that we can also fill in to some extent. When I say the encyclopedic, for example, if you look up Cobb salad, um, you should be able to answer, does it have bacon or does it have a hard boiled egg in it? Well, that's pretty encyclopedic. It has nothing to do with the word. It has to do with the phenomenon of a Cobb salad. We have to give enough detail in the definition so that you can distinguish a Cobb salad from a Caesar salad. Um, but that's it. We, we are not responsible for giving you a full recipe, although in these cases they almost are recipes. Um, but in the case of a, of, a, of, a, of a phenomenon, like for example, financial inflation or love uh, or happiness, we are not describing the phenomenon, we are describing the word that labels that phenomenon. And that may be a thin line, that may be a philosophical line, but I think it's an important one for all of us to remember. This is, uh, this is a little bit hard to read, but this shows um, the, uh, the calendar around uh, the beginning of a school year. Right here, these are weekends, the low points, the high points show that the word culture is one of the words that spikes at back to school every year, but it's not the only one. We see the words diversity and plagiarism begin at the beginning of every semester. And so we can tell that in, um, in, in um, the orientation sessions, uh, at universities and schools all over America that these are the words that are that are that are looked up another word that gets looked up like culture is the word science the words science and culture are so broad and, and, and in their application that I, and that once again when they seem specific in the name of a course for example or in the name of a textbook it sends many people to the dictionary who who may have been comfortable with the word culture in its broadest sense but when it suddenly seems super specific culture through film um, you know, uh, sub-Saharan culture. When, when the word suddenly seems narrow, that's what sends people to the dictionary. And obviously plagiarism is an idea that maybe seems extremely technical or legal in many ways at that moment. Now, sometimes there are words that are, that are spiking in our data and we have no idea why they're looked up. So for example, here's, uh, this is an engine I, I've, we had made for me to look at our data. Here's some of the words. This is a Sunday evening, it's 9 p.m. The word, the top word is the word huskau. Huskau is a word that means jail uh, or prison. And I went on Twitter uh, uh, on this Sunday evening and I said, did somebody just, because it's, if it's 9 p.m., that's prime time, right? So I, I asked on Twitter, did, did someone use the word huskau on TV? And the answer was yes, that there was, during the Sunday night football game, there was a streaker on the field. The streaker was caught. And what happened for the color commentator um, on TV when this happens. Play stops, but they have to keep talking. And one of the things they said is, they caught the guy, they're gonna bring him to the Huskow, they're gonna bring him to jail. Um, and so he was filling, as you do on TV, and he used this colorful word um, in that moment. And by the way, the last time I gave this lecture was to a group of teachers in, uh, in a foreign country uh, in, in Poland, and I had to explain what streaking was to them. So at least in this case, <laughs> most of you know this. We see other interesting phenom phenomena here. We see that maybe for the first time since the early 18th century, English is competing with itself for spelling. So the, the, uh, the, generally, um, the generally accepted standard spelling of this word, which we pronounce camaraderie, is the lower one, the French spelling, which in French is pronounced differently, camaraderie, which, in which you hear all the vowels. Um, but this alternative spelling, which we do include in our dictionaries as a variant, um, camaraderie, which looks more like an English phonetic spelling, um, is competing with camaraderie. I think that we might see that the preferred spelling of this word may change in the next century, um, and we kind of see that in our data. Um, now, I report on this stuff on Twitter, and sometimes just because I'm watching this stuff, I see things that if you're a word nerd, you notice. So for example, a rare etymological, meteorological, political coincidence, lookups in the word clemency were spiking on the same day that lookups for the word inclement was spiking and clemency was from Ed Edward Snowden and Clement inclement was from the word from, was from a snowstorm from a blizzard so there's no obviously relationship between Snowden and snow but there is an etymological relationship between clemency and inclement and it's just one of those things if you watch the data you see things start to cross and 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 and, and connect now the elephant in the room, if you will, is politics, obviously, because that's been a big story in American culture for not just this year, but 
the last few years. Um, notable for, for Vermont in particular is uh, the fact that the word socialism spiked off the charts when Bernie Sanders first announced his initial candidacy in 2015. I remember this night, I remember where I made this tweet from, I was in Los Angeles at a conference and it was interesting and it's just worth noting that, you know, in my um, college days, in my 30s even, it would have been unthinkable for a presidential candidate to self-identify as a socialist. So needless to say, that huge movement in the culture, that huge movement in the politics, um, sends a lot of people to the dictionary because also it has to be said the word socialist uh, and socialism uh, is often used as an insult or an epithet. And that, again, can send people to the dictionary in a consistent way. During the Trump administration, um, there's been a lot of, uh, needless to say, a lot of curiosity about the words that are used. The word complicit um, was looked up. Uh, there were two spikes that week. It was used um, uh, in, a, um, in a Saturday Night Live sketch that you might remember that starred Scarlett Johansson as Ivanka Trump. And then later that same week, Ivanka Trump appeared on uh, national news in which she was asked point blank, are you complicit? And she answered, I'm complicit if that means helping the president. And so she indicated clearly that she doesn't know what complicit means. And you better believe that sends people to the dictionary. So we got two spikes from that one. Um, also, uh, in the early part of the Trump administration, there was a huge interest in the misspellings um, from Trump and from others. And in this case, he, he misspelled the word heal. In this case, he, un he misspelled the word unprecedented as unprecedented and we got enormous uh, interest. And I have to say that in the first two years of his presidency, there was enormous interest in his misspellings and a lot of people like to laugh at it or make fun of it. That's not what we're doing here. We're having a little fun with it. But what we are reporting is the data shows us that the country is looking up this word to confirm the spelling or the presence of a word in the dictionary. And that, that alerts us that it, it, in fact, the, the country is asking us a question. And so we feel like we can answer that question on Twitter. I have to tell you though, that in the last 12 months and more, the misspellings have been uh, as frequent, if not more frequent, and yet we haven't been seeing much interest in the misspellings uh, of his tweets, but much more interest in simply the meaning or the misuse of uh, words in his tweets. The biggest one maybe was this one, the word fact, when it was um, used in the phrase alternative fact. We are living in a time of alternative facts and fake news and a, a real war on science and truth. And to some extent, it seems to me that the dictionary, which is regarded as a neutral and objective arbiter of the truth, uh, of this tool that we have, which is language, which, and I think the dictionary is maybe the best evidence we have of human consensus, because between two covers, we show that over a couple thousand years, many millions of people have agreed that a certain set of sounds mean a very specific thing that allows us to understand each other. And without that understanding, we can't move forward, we can't share ideas. It's a very basic thing, but I think it's an important point to make, that people come to the dictionary in these times um, as a kind of backstop um, to, to, to check on themselves, to check on others, and to, to, to find common ground. And when I mean that, I don't mean that as in a political way at all. I mean simply a common ground of meaning. Now, uh, just uh, in this past March, obviously we've all lived through this time, these were the words that were spiking on the very first day uh, in which I was uh, forced to work from home. And they tell a story, pandemic, coronavirus, quarantine, corona, epidemic, draconian, lockdown, novel. I won't read them all, but we can see them. Notice that these words fall into a few different categories. Some of them are medical, like pandemic and corona, coronavirus, which was already in the dictionary, epidemic. Now, some of these words were governmental in terms of the government's response, like quarantine, martial law, lockdown draconian. Some of these words were broader. They were more of the public's response, word like calamity uh, or Kafkaesque or postpone. And notice one, two, the word cancel. And I bet that that word was there because everything was being canceled back then, as you remember. I think this word was, is in this list for the simple reason that people were asking, does it have one L or two? Um, and so people were looking this up for a very mechanical reason. And I think that to me is poignant that they turn to the dictionary in that moment because they need help. Now, notice the word that isn't there. The word COVID is not there because the word COVID on March 13th, COVID was coined in mid-February. And you might've heard that Merriam-Webster did a special release of a couple dozen new words in the end of March. And so the world, the all-time record for us 
between the coinage of a word and its entry into our dictionary is 34 days, and that word was COVID-19, for obvious reasons. We could see in our data that everyone, everyone was curious about this word. Um, and we had already drafted, our science editors had already drafted the definition, and we saw no reason to hold this word back. And by the way, the, the record was previously held, the record was previously two years between coinage and entry into a print dictionary at that time. The word was AIDS. Um, now, in more recent months, uh, we saw, in, this was a viral tweet. This is maybe the second most uh, retweeted tweet that we've had at Merriam-Webster. Um, the terms stand back and stand by, again, when we see people looking up these terms, which are defined as open compounds, stand by, has a definition in the dictionary. When people are looking these words up in massive numbers, they are implicitly asking us a question. And so Twitter is an interesting place where we can uh, answer that question directly. Um, it was very unusual to see the word fly uh, after the vice presidential debate when a fly landed on Mike Pence's hair, but that's what happened. And the word was in our data. Um, I just made this slide about an hour ago. This was, uh, this, was this morning. Uh, and these were the words that were looked up this morning. Democracy, contested election. We have an entry for contested election. There's the word incumbent, the word modest, nail biter, empathy, integrity, character, Republican, disenfranchise, change, justice, pandemic, environment, referendum, constitution, malarkey, confirm, republic, democrat, and electoral. So you can, these words tell a story. They tell a poignant story. This is what we were thinking about uh, at uh, 1019 today. Um, and so sometimes we're reading a kind of a, a map of our concerns, a map of our interests when we look up at words in the dictionary. And I want to make sure that we understand that even when basic words are looked up, that curiosity is not ignorance when we look up words. You know, often before a presidential debate, the word debate itself spikes. Also the word moderator. And I will sometimes tweet that and people will respond to me. People will tweet to me and say, well, no wonder America is going uh, in the wrong direction. We don't even know what the word debate means. We're so stupid. And I always think, well, no, I think that when people are looking up a word like debate, just before a debate, we are looking for nuance. We are looking for detail. We might be looking for etymology. I mean, think of the questions you might have. Um, can only, are, does a debate only involve two uh, individuals? Can it be more? Can there be more than one moderator? Does the moderator have to be a journalist? Um, does the moderator have to be neutral? I mean, there are so many questions that can be answered from the dictionary. Um, uh, clearly, people are watching these debates with the dictionary open and with their app open. Here's another tweet that went viral. This shows you that showbiz plays a role. Um, when Doctor Who, when the new Doctor Who was announced, it was announced that the actor was a woman. There was kind of a backlash on uh, social media that people said, well, Doctor Who has to be a man. And so we made this simple tweet, doctor has no gender in English. You of all people, this group of people here at UVM, you know that this is one of the dumbest tweets that we could make because of course no noun has a, has a grammatical gender in English. Um, and yet uh, 63,000 people retweeted it uh, because it seemed to, you know, it connected with what people were thinking about. We call these, these uh, tweets and these articles Trend Watch. You can find them on our website. Um, uh, I just, I, th these just show some of them uh, during, during the year. Um, you can find them on our homepage. Just look on the bottom left and you can see uh, which, new, which words are trending in the news. This is also the way that we choose our word of the year, which is coming up really soon in December. Our word of the year is a statistical measure of the words that were looked up this year more than last year. Something uh, about this year that sent people to the dictionary. So obviously 2008, uh, the Great Recession, the word was bailout. Um, the word was science for various reasons in 2013. The word was justice in 2019, and we don't know what it will be this year. My bet will be it could be related to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, clearly that you know, was an enormous subject of curiosity. Now, we have a different kind of behavior with our, with our, with our, with our apps on, on our uh, uh, mobile uh, devices than we do with a desktop computer. For, for, for one thing, we tend to look up the swear words, the dirty words, much more frequently from our phones than from our desktop computers. There's, there's a clear behavior there. But there's something else that we see that's interesting and consistent, which is late in the nighttime, we see two-letter words, like this word, chi, or like the word za, spelled Z-A, for pizza. And we can tell that in bedrooms and barrooms all over America, people are playing Scrabble. And we can see the Scrabble words at the top of our list. Now, this also happens on the afternoon of Thanksgiving and the afternoon of Christmas. 
Um, and so this kind of brings us to the end of this story, which is we can get a sense of what sends people to the dictionary just by looking at which words are being looked up at, an, any, at a given moment. And the fact is, our job is to tell the truth about words. Philip Gove was the editor of our unabridged dictionary back in the 50s and 60s. It's a book that Jacques knows very, very well. And, and it's a book that was considered to be very descriptive. For the linguists among you, the people who, are, uh, who study linguistics, you understand what that word means in linguistics terms. But being descriptive also can be understood in a, in a kind of general way. The job of the dictionary is to describe the language, the way the words are actually used, tell the truth about words. Well, when, when Philip Gove said that back in the 60s, he meant only in one direction. He meant tell the truth about words on the pages of the dictionary. We'll do the research and we'll present it to the public. But now we can come full circle and tell the truth about what words the public is interested in and which words they are looking up at, at a very given and specific moment. And so I feel like this kind of data you know, kind of completes the circle. We can tell more truth about language by reporting these facts. Now, the, the, to end the thread of business to this story, the Collegiate Dictionary, uh, that is the basis of our online dictionary, is also the best-selling hardcover book in American history uh, after the Bible. So the fact is, when we made it online for free, we were taking a big risk in our business. Uh, and that risk has been rewarded with a, a successful website. So we get paid not only through the sale of print books, which are still selling, uh, but in smaller numbers than they used to, but we also get money from the advertising and the revenue uh, through, the, um, th through the app and through the website. So please use our dictionary because it helps support our work. But the fact is, uh, now that we know more about the way people use dictionaries, we've got a story to tell, and that story is has all the nuance and texture and detail that we never had before about what makes a person look up a word. So thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing so we can maybe go to some questions. And I don't know how to um yeah, thank you. And do That was I, outstanding. Yes, thank you. Can I can I um relinquish it's Wonderful. Wonderful. Can I relinquish um uh can someone else control the um Let's see. You probably can. Or, or if anyone wants a question, of course, they can simply. Um, yeah, just unmute yourself and then and ask a question, I guess. Um. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, so thank you so much for the talk. That was like very amazingly interesting. I was hooked the whole time. Um, I, I just want to know. Um, what are your thoughts on something like the Urban Dictionary, where you have all this brand new like internet slang that people want to know what it means, and it's it's in the Urban Dictionary because uh, it's not just in like word lingo, because um, people are are looking for what the meaning is. Oh, absolutely. Well, I I think it's incredibly useful. Um, I think the 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 magic of crowdsourcing. You know, when we go back to the Oxford English Dictionary, you might know that um, in the newspapers and in literary journals, they put ads and they said, please send us words, send us words that you find, you know, in your reading, in your reading of Austin or Shakespeare or Spencer or Milton. So that was crowdsourcing. So today, um, our, our standards haven't changed. You know, we need a lot of research. We still have cr criteria to add a new word. Typically, we say three criteria. A word has to show uh, long-term use, it has to show widespread use, and it has to show meaningful use so that we can understand exactly what is meant by the word. And um, so we watch words. It takes time for a word to enter the dictionary, uh, the proper dictionary, through the editorial process at Oxford or Merriam-Webster. But it's, isn't it wonderful that the, the language, which changes so quickly, can also have a kind of knee-jerk uh, response, can have a kind of immediate um, accounting in Urban Dictionary. I think that's terrific. And, and interestingly enough, for the most part, the democracy works uh, intellectually uh, in a place like Wikipedia, uh, where it's, we've all come to essentially trust a lot of that material, even though it hasn't gone through necessarily a rigorous editorial process. If anything is meaningful to people, like who knows, like the uh, facts about the lives of John Lennon and Paul McCartney, um, then you better, be you better get it right because people will correct you. Um, and I think that kind of democ that kind of democratic crowdsourcing is is terrific online. At the same time, I, it's clear that the value of the encyclopedic fact 
um, in the environment of the internet has, has declined. Um, but the value of the lexical fact, uh, I think, hasn't. In other words, what I mean by that is that people still come to the accredited dictionary, Merriam-Webster, uh, to get the real, you know, serious definition, the one that um, has a lot of research and a lot of history behind it. And I'm gratified that, that so far that's been true. Uh, and so we can exist alongside something like, um, like Urban Dictionary and sort of, I think they, we, we can enrich each other. And I, I, I think it's terrific that people go there and, and post meanings for, for terms that I may not have ever heard of in my whole life. Thank you. Thank you. So any other, any other questions? Yes, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. I looked, I, I have my 1975 Miriam right here. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and I looked up Huskow. Oh, yes. when, when I was a kid, Huskow, because when I was a kid, it also meant going to the outhouse. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was in rural Maine. You were, you were off to the Huskow. Well, I'll have to look it up in an older dictionary. Maybe that sense has dropped from our uh, from our current dictionary, but that's fascinating. And that's a good reason to keep old dictionaries. So I have one, I, I can see it right behind me there, a, a, a copy of Webster's Second from 1934. And I use it all the time to compare and to see what was dropped and what was kept, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, standards change. The language is always changing and it, keeping up with it is a full-time job, believe me. Um, so that's terrific. And thank you for, for that comment. Thank you for your talk. Not at all. Um, I have a question, which is, um, how do you deal with uh, colloquialisms? Like words that are widespread, but only in a certain area. Like, is there a... Um, minimum geographic area that a word needs to cover for it to be entered in the dictionary? Well, the easy answer is the criteria are the same for all words. And that means, you know, widespread use, long-term use, and meaningful use. So the fact is, uh, for true colloquialisms that are maybe spoken much more than they're written down, it's hard to trace them because our, our research requires evidence. And that evidence is in the form of citate, what we call citations. Um, if you think of a corpus, something that you can search, in other words, what that does is it privileges published, edited text, doesn't it? Um, if a word is used in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe, then you better believe we're going to notice it, we're going to see it. If a word is only used in a very small, narrow context, which might be professional, it might be informal, uh, it might be uh, only youth, uh, it might be only youth of one region of the country, it will take longer for us to notice that for that reason. And so that all that means is it will take a lot longer for such a word to get into the dictionary. But we have labels for regions, you know, chiefly New England, chiefly Brit chiefly British, chiefly Australian. Um, we also have the, the label um, slang uh, to, to, in, a, a, to, to indicate that it's an informal term. We, al we also use the term informal. So we use both slang and informal. At one time, we had a bunch of labels. We had um, slang, colloquial, informal, um, and illiterate. We actually had the label illiterate on some words, which was obviously kind of a judgment more on the user than on the word itself. So I'm happy to say we removed that label because partly it was in, it was sort of offensive. And also it was hard to understand what it really meant. And we dropped the label colloquial and just kept slang because nobody could explain what the difference was. Um, and so we try to make it as clear as possible that this is a word that's used in informal contexts, it's maybe more spoken than it's written. Um, so the, the, the simple answer again is that we need evidence. We need so much evidence that we sort of require that word to be written down in a lot of sources. And that, that can make it hard to track. So we're not a slang dictionary. There are such things. There are wonderful dictionaries of informal English and regional English. This DARE, the Dictionary of American Regional English, the D-A-R-E, which I highly recommend to anyone. And that's a that's a wonderful reference that tracks that kind of language. We are really looking at published, uh, published official language, of, uh, and, and that gives a, a significant bias to educated professional writing. For good or bad. I, you know. 
Hi. I have a question too. Thank you so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm a lexicographer, but um, in bilingual dictionaries, I've worked a lot on Italian, German, German, Italian dictionaries. Wow. And so it was very interesting for me to listen to someone with an experience in a, such an important monolingual dictionary. And I remember um, a few years back, there was this big controversy when Merriam-Webster changed um, the meaning of marriage. And I was just hmm. curious if there were other words that had such a strong response from the audience. I love your example for love, but that was more of a sweet sort of yeah. meaning looking letter. But are there any words like marriage that had a real big uh, response from the audience? Oh, sure. I mean, there are many. And, and, uh, and marriage is, is an interesting one to track because it had it's essentially three stages, right? It began uh, with only the definition of the traditional marriage between a man and a woman, and it was described that way. And then we added a second subsense um, that was a marriage, a, a, a contract like that, uh, or a relationship like that of a traditional marriage uh, between two, two spouses of the same gender, of the same sex. Um, because we found that same-sex marriage was almost always identified that way. In other words, they weren't using the word marriage to refer to gay marriage. They were saying gay marriage or same-sex marriage. And, and that meant it was always modified, right? It was always, uh, so that meant for us, it had to be a separate sense. Until now, now it has been so absorbed into the culture that marriage means marriage and spouse means spouse uh, and partner or husband or wife. Those words have become uh, completely folded into uh, same-sex marriage as it had been. So we removed the second subsense and we simply meant uh, we simply made it one definition that accounts for both uh, in one definition. So it, again, three stages, one that was purely heterosexual, one that had added a second subsense to account for uh, gay marriage, and a third which, which collapsed them together into a single definition. And I think that's interesting because it shows also the evolution of published usage, that people like at the New York Times or whatever identified gay marriage specifically and isolated it linguistically until they didn't. And when they didn't, then we changed the dictionary. So the dictionary reflects the culture in that way. Now, there are other ones. There's an, an, a, a recent example is the word racism. Uh, and the word racism, uh, we, I learned a lot about just this summer. Um, do you realize, it, first of all, the word racism was never entered in a Merriam-Webster dictionary until 1939, which strikes me as being pretty recent. Um, and uh, that means that, for example, the United States went through the Civil War without the word racism. Um, and if you look through Abraham Lincoln's correspondence, uh, the writings of Frederick Douglass, they did not use the word racism. It was not a word. Um, they used racial prejudice. That was the term that they used. And we did have an entry for racialism, which had the same meaning, but simply never caught on. And what's interesting to me, because I went back into the office during the pandemic, to look at the, um, the, 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 uh, the manuscript and the citations from the 1930s. And I have all the handwritten citations. It was written up in the Atlantic, by the way, by Ben Zimmer. Um, and so you can see some of these um, citations. Mm -hmm. But um, we found that the word racism was entered in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary entirely in the context of Nazism, not mm -hmm. in the context <laughs> of domestic racism the way we understand it today. Uh, between, for example, black Americans and white Americans, but entirely in the European context of the new policies put in place by Nazis. Um, and there was much evidence that we had and, and showed very clearly. And if you read that initial definition, it talks about the governmental policies of racism uh, that we would today maybe refer to as systemic. Uh, and yet that was a word that was never connected with racism until about 50 years ago, around 1970, uh, in in, uh, scientific, in sociolog sociological journals, the word systemic was begun, uh, began to be used in conjunction with the word racism. So we redrafted that uh, definition not to add a new meaning, the meaning was there, uh, but the meaning was written in a context that really didn't apply anymore. And the word systemic itself is a useful term to us today um, to add to that definition. So we updated the language to make it that of the 21st century. We didn't add a new meaning. The meanings were there and they were, they were expressed pretty well, but we write definitions in a, in a more plain language way than we used to. Um, there was there's something sort of uh, devilishly efficient, maybe almost too efficient about some of those old definitions. And I think Jacques knows what I mean. That some of them are so short that it's hard to understand them. And because we have more room online, we can, we can write in a way that kind of seems more human, more, more easy to understand. Um, and so we redid that definition just this past uh, spring. 
uh, and it reflects uh, the, the modern uh, evidence that we have. Uh, and again, we didn't add a new meaning, we simply recast it in, in the 21st century. And the, the, the point being, our job is revision. It, the job of a lexicographer is, and you know this, if, as a bilingual lexicographer, mm -hmm. you probably used, you probably defined very few words that were neologisms, that were brand new <laughs> words. Your job was to translate a, li a living language in current, uh, in current way. Um, in current terms, and, and that's our job too. Um, new words get a lot of press and they're kind of sexy, but they're not our whole job, you know. And by the way, I just want to say that I spent my first six years doing nothing but bilingual lexicography. Oh, um, uh -huh. And so I, I'm very proud of our French English bilingual bidirectional dictionary, which is still a, 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 a useful dictionary. Um, and it's one that, um, that got me this job. And then after that project, I moved to a dictionary for non-native speakers of English, what we call a learner's dictionary writing definitions with plain language. And then finally, I ended up writing for our unabridged and collegiate dictionary. So now I am more of a monolingual lexicographer, but I started as a pure bilingual lexicographer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. I a question. Yes. Um, that was a fantastic talk, really wonderful. Um, could you say a few words maybe, please, about the drafting process? Once you decide to add a word, what's the process that you go through to get the wording just right? And what are those considerations? That's, that's a terrific question. So generally speaking, in, 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 the, uh, in the old days and still today, um, there, we, have a, a, we, we have the only staff left in North America, I'm sad to say, by the way, uh, about 25 people who work all day, every day on the dictionary. When I joined 25 years ago, there were 45 people on the floor. And I was working with seven editors every day who had been there since before I was born. Um, including one who was still on the staff from Webster's Third, Jack. So, so I really, so I feel that, in other words, the continuity was important. We were trained in a very particular way in a seminar to write definitions with the particular language that, that is accurate, also using the particular grammar that we need uh, to, to, to write our definitions. Notice that a Merriam-Webster definition is always grammatically just. And what I mean by that is if you look up a, a, a verb, it's a verb phrase as a definition. If you look up uh, an adjective, it's an adjectival phrase. And so that means that the definition itself can be substituted into the sentence uh, for the head word. And that's the gold standard of a Merriam-Webster de definition is substitutability. Um, and and that, that's, a, that's a real word problem. To write a short phrase that can substitute for a given single word and still be grammatically um, uh, to, 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 and still scan grammatically. So the process is this, you get your uh, assignment. Say you have a word, you're given the word and the word is sesquipedalian. And then you, the next thing is you'll get um, the citations. You'll look at all the collected evidence that we have in the office and then you'll look it up in several different corpora. You'll look it up in the COCA, you'll look it up in LexisNexis, you'll look it up in, in, in academic corpora. Um, and to see how the word is used. And, and then you'll break it down. It used to be when it was pa on paper, like three by five cards, you would literally make piles and say, I think this word has three different meanings. And, uh, and I'm gonna try to work with all, these, all this evidence um, and, 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 and prove that it has only three different meanings. And, and maybe on day three, you'll recognize, oh, actually, here's one that's a fourth meaning, but it's kind of a subset of the second one. So that'll be two A and two B. And then as a junior editor, you'll draft it. You'll draft that definition. You'll write it as clearly as you can, as short as you can, uh, maybe um, adding a couple example sentences. And then it goes up the chain. It goes up to a, 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 an associate editor, a copy, what we call copy editor, who will check the language, who will make sure that it's, uh, it's got the right grammar, and who will check the, the, um, the, the, the evidence, the back, what we call the backing. And, uh, and maybe you know, change it and shorten it, maybe add it, maybe say, you know what, you thought those were two substances, they're really the same, we'll collapse them back into one. And then it'll go up to a senior editor, and then it'll go up to the final reader, and then finally to the editor in chief. So and, and in the meantime, it'll go to the phonetics editor, to the, etymologi the et etymologist, um, to the cross-reference editor, um, to make sure that, for example, you don't use any word in that definition that we don't have a definition for itself. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it, so everything has consequences. One thing I learned about the word racism that's amazing, that's kind of mind blowing, in the manuscript written in handwriting from November of 1938, one editor wrote to her boss, is racism added in our new addenda? Because I want to use the word in a, de in a definition. In other words, we added the word racism to the dictionary not because 
the word was new and used frequently, but because an editor wanted to use the word in a definition of another word. Um, and so, you know, that, that all plays a role. So anyway, it's a lot of juggling until the final reader and the editor in chief, and those are the last set of eyes. Uh, and they're very polished by the time because they have so much to do. They're only reading very carefully edited material so that they can mostly just maybe tinker with the language or just leave it alone and approve it. Um, and so basically it's, it's, it's a mechanical process in the sense that um, there's no committee. Uh, there are no meetings that say, should we add this? Should we not add this? If, if, a, if a junior editor finds a lot of evidence for a given word, that, that editor adds the word. And then uh, only at a higher level in the chain, they might say, you know what? Uh, we wanna wait a year. Let's wait a year on this one. And they'll just simply put it in a different file for next year. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it, thank you very much. It, but it is a process. And, and one thing that I miss is giving tours in our building because I, I usually walk across the entire editorial floor because there are different stations to show the different um, uh, parts of that process. Hey, we have, we have a question. Um, first, I drew you a picture of your talk, like a sketch in the chat, um, and then question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if if you know anything about the demographics of people who use Miriam Webster's search versus just like Googling it, and if that kind of has borne out any interesting differences in the sort of words that come up in your stories. I think, I mean, we, we have only scratched the surface with that. It's clear uh, that, and sometimes I see reports from other dictionaries, and sometimes they look like ours, and sometimes they don't, and that tells me that different people are, are using different dictionaries for sure. Um, I like to think that the people who come to Merriam-Webster are pretty smart, um, and it seems to me that the words tend to, um, they tend to, tend to go that way. They tend to be the, the words about details uh, 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 and not um, more, more generic words, um, but that's a very general statement. Um, in terms of Google, we, of course, we, have, we get a lot of traffic from Google and a lot of traffic uh, directly. We have, you know, those are the two main ways people get to us. Um, Google is such a broad, tool it's a, it's kind of you know the, the 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 shot the shotgun approach you know just like look for any anything that catches um whereas dic look, dictionary definitions tend to be very narrow in aim um so the narrower your search the more likely you're to come directly to merriam webster if you're really if it's really broad and you, you don't know what white vinegar is you may be really asking a question for for a cooking website, um, but then you might land at Merriam-Webster just because you Googled it and we were the third hit, you know, who knows? So the fact is, um, uh, there are people on staff in our office in New York who are experts in SEO and search engine optimization. And, and so they look at search behavior. And, and you mentioned where it comes from. Once in a blue moon, we'll have a search that just makes no sense. And we'll say, hey, where did that come from? And we will see, hey, all the searches came from the Philippines or all the searches came from Turkey. And we do sometimes narrow it down to that just for our own edification. Now we don't know what you are looking up at home. You know, we have too much data to, to bother with. It's a hundred million pages a month and it's two billion lookups a year on the app. So it's, an, it's, it's a lot of data. Um, so we are interested in big trends. We're not interested in small trends. This also means that there's a very, very long tail. Something I'd love to write about and think about is what is the least looked up word in the dictionary? Um, and the problem is there's about 500,000 words that we have there. And the least looked up word would probably be in a tie with about maybe 30 or 40,000 others uh, of words that are maybe looked up once or twice a year. Um, but nevertheless, I think that would be interesting. One thing that is also interesting is which words are looked up for phonetics because we have pronunci audio pronunciation, so you can hear which word, you know, what they sound like. Those are uh, the top words. There are words like Schadenfreude and niche, N-I-C-H-E, niche, niche. Um, so, in other words, recent foreign borrowings that tend to keep the phonotactics of the of of a, of a foreign language. Um, th those are words that are looked up for phonetic reasons. And so, th these are all kind of interesting things. There's so much richness in a text like a dictionary. And to me, there's something else which we haven't even mentioned, which is that alphabetical order is arbitrary, right? It's completely arbitrary. And yet chronological order is not. In other words, the order in which words enter the, the language um, reflects human patterns of migration, of interest in cooking, uh, politics, um, 
Uh, and so uh, because we put the date of first use on every entry in, in, in Merriam-Webster, if you scroll down, you'll see that. Uh, the, 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 it'll give you the year if it's before the, uh, the 15th century. So it'll say 1692 or 1969 or 2006. And then you can click there and you will reorganize, you'll reorder the entire dictionary into chronological order. So you can actually look at the dictionary. We call it time traveler. So go to an entry, scroll down, look at the date, and then click on, it'll say something like other words from this year. And you will actually see the entire dictionary shift to chronological order. And these are things that were not possible in a print dictionary. And as much as I love print dictionaries and I use them every day, um, the flexibility of online for audio, for videos, if you go on our, on our website, you'll see the vid videos, some of them by me, um, which are rich and helpful. Um, but also the, um, the, the idea of uh, chronological order is incredibly rich and, and meaningful. And so I think that uh, the online dictionary in many ways is, is the expression, is the greater expression of what we can do uh, and, and with manipulating this data, which is really hum humanistic information. I hope that tell, answers your question. That was, that was great. Yeah, awesome, thank you. I wanna click on your, law, your, your, your link here so I can see. Um, oh, the, 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 some, somebody else put in that um, the blog about you're using the wrong dictionary, right? I'm not sure who did that. Um, oops. And hang on. Are there other questions? Um, Peter, yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm another Peter. Uh, so that was fantastic. Absolutely thrilling. Just, just oh, the greatest you. thing ever. Yeah, no, I love this beyond belief. I, I'm one of those people who grew up reading the dictionary. Oh, then you're one of us. <laughs> yeah. But I will say that that wasn't, um, there were lots of things I did, I guess there were outliers, but in Australia and New Zealand where I grew up, that was kind of normal. There's a lot of wordplay and fun with language. And for some reason that was a acceptable behavior. So I, I, I want to say that some cultures, it's okay. Um, I have so many things that I would like to talk to you about, but uh, uh, we, and, and I'm going to limit it, but we, we do, Chris mentioned this before we, we have, uh, analyzed all sorts of corpora in mm -hmm. our work over 15 years now. And we do have a piece now, which is storywrangling.org. It's Story Wrangler. And I just want to, and that's, that's for Twitter. It's ngrams on Twitter over time at day scale. And you can look at them going back to 2008. Now, you know, we've looked at books, we've looked at all these other things. The thing about this is that it's stories, right? And, and you, you, of course, framed, you know, the, the, the pieces you're finding popping up around stories. And, and so that's this deep interest for us is, what are the stories of populations? How do they kind of grow and kind of pass away? And how do they fight against each other and all those sorts of things? So, I mean, I would just love, I think we could, we could do amazing things together. We'll, we sure. want to do the, yeah, we can do the rarely search for words, the not search for it all, the simply not search for yeah, it all. We, we need to talk about that's, all of this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's totally a, a jam for us. And, um, you know, we are kind of mixed social science um, tech, tech people. So we're, we're not, you know, just out from one box, uh, just to just to sort of wave that flag. But um, I will say one last thing is that I remember looking at the dictionary for the word obstropolis, mm. which my mother would say as a joke, right? She would say, you, you three, three boys were being obstropolis again. And I remember seeing obstropolis and then reading illiterate variant of yeah. obstreperous. Of obstreperous. Like, it was a blow. It was a blow. I mean, my mother was being funny, but I also felt like, just as you said, it was like, that's, so well, I think, I mean, and, and you, I mean, it just gets back to a very important point, which is um, we judge everyone always by yes. the way they use language. And yes. you today had to judge me by the way I sound, by the way I look. It's just, it's a fact. It's a cultural, social fact. And mm -hmm. so we are always judged. We're judged on Twitter. And, and, and it's interesting that language in terms of spelling, which is arbitrary in English, of course, and in terms of accent, which is often more to do with mm -hmm. region than to do with education. But we, these things are what, what I call usage. We haven't even talked about this, but usage is kind of the cultural aspect of the dictionary because usage ha has to do with that, that note of uh, illiterate. That was what we call a usage note. And so yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the cultural phenomenon of the word, not the lexical. And what does that mean? Culture has to do with region, education, age, prejudice. Um, oh, absolutely, so, yeah. There's a huge amount of prejudice that, uh, and in many ways, as many people say, language is the last 
a sort of socially acceptable form of prejudice. You would never criticize someone's, uh, for example, uh, ethnic origin, but boy, if they misspell a word or they mispronounce it, oh, then, you know, have at them and make fun of them uh, and in a very public way. And you see this on Twitter every single day. Now, I take no yeah. joy whatsoever in making fun of someone's spelling, uh, misspelling of the English language, which is devilishly difficult. Um, at the same time, at the same time, um, writing well, using good grammar, spelling correctly, that shows that you possess the keys to a club, that you're a member of a club of people who think that this is important. Um, and maybe you're a part of the club that knows the difference between obstreperous and obstrepolis. And um, that is a shibboleth that simply says, ah, you're one of us. Yes. And it's an important point because that means that language is used every bit as much to divide us as it is to bring us together. And, uh, and so, for example, if someone heard, and I, there's an easy example I can use, you haven't heard so much tonight, my native idiolect, which is, I, I'm from greater Boston, I have a Boston accent, at one time in my life, I'm sure I sounded much more like that than I do today. I went to live in Europe and different things happened. And mm -hmm. also, the, my own prejudices in my, my younger days, I probably felt, well, no one on TV, none of my professors sound like the people I grew up with, so I have to adjust my English. So we all do this. Sure. However, I'm, I'm not self-conscious about it. I'm proud of my heritage. There's one of the videos that I do in which I talk about the history of the little engravings, the little drawings in the dictionary, and I use that word. Mm. That word, D-R-A-W-I-N-G, is a word that a non-rhotic speaker such as myself, I often have the intrusion of an mm -hmm. R. So I very clear, so people have written into the Merriam-Webster website to say, why does your man have uh, no education and doesn't know how to talk because <laughs> he, he says drawings. Um, and I, I'm happy to answer them and simply say, you know, look, this reflects my regional background much more mm -hmm. than anything else. And so this kind of snobbery, I think it's, it's the kind of thing that the, oh, yeah. more you, the more you learn, the less snob, snobbish you become. And, and I think yes. the, the, the more open and accepting, and that gets back to this idea of descriptivism. What are we doing? You don't mm -hmm. say that a word is illiterate because that's judging the user. You judge the word. Fantastic. Well, clearly it's drawings. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, no, I, I, and look, I have great empathy for that. I mean, because I, I grew up in the country and moving into the city, you know, the light, you speak in a different way. And the further you go up the tree in Australia, the more English it sounded. And it was, it's not as bad as England, perhaps, but it's very, yeah, oh, no, absolutely. They know yeah. who you are straight and away. And it's different, and it's different in different cultures, obviously. I yep. mean, I lived yeah, in, yeah. In, yeah. in France, and just to see the way French people treat uh, Quebecers, for example. Um, oh, they and, hate and, the and, Quebec it, accent. Yeah, oh and, and it's, really, it's, it's a remarkable thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it shows you, in, in many ways, France is more centralized in, 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 in their education and in their language, um, and, but there are regional variants. Uh, English is unusual. Uh, English, German, and Italian have massive regional variation. In, in, English has, mm -hmm. weirdly, has much less of it for whatever reason. Um, and, but um, it's still something we hold dear. And, you know, my home sound is still my home sound, and I love it. So... <laughs> I, I want to say, uh, this connects to your chronological stuff as well, that we have a paper that we haven't published, but it's from the OED, and it's the uh, metaphor project, really, the sort of the historical thesaurus, which you may yes. be familiar with. But, but it really, so I was very interested in that. And, and what we, we have with that is, you know, what are the, what are the categories of words? How, do they, how have they evolved over the last thousand years? Yes. And it's super interesting. You, know, you see, like leisure or leisure has really exploded you know, recently, as you might expect, but just that kind of change and the explosion of the 1400s. Anyway, we need to publish this, but I would, I mean, I would just love to show you. And that. you know, that, that I've turned into, so for everybody, if you wonder kind of what I do all day, which is a question people ask often, because I'm not really a definer anymore. Um, one of the things that I do with it, because of the website, so many people come, there's so much human history that's compacted into those etymologies and into those definitions. And Jacques knows this better than anything. And um, I have kind of, with a small team, we have kind of made a new, a new profession, which is e explicating uh, human history through, uh, through language. So in other words, uh, just to look at a word like the word wonderful, um, which until the 20th century only meant full of, it only meant astonishing. So if you look at, look at the word wonderful in the King James Bible, there's a, there's a sentence in which, you know, God, thy plagues are wonderful. Um, so very clearly it did not mean excellent, like as in a wonderful meal, the way we would use it today. Um, but then think of, and then I, I, I tripped over a sentence that in Thomas Jefferson's uh, letters, 
And he wrote at, in 1826, at the age of 84 or something, uh, he was asked a question about the Constitutional Convention. He said, look, 45 years later, and at, the, at my own age, my memory is feeble. It is not wonderful that I should not recall all of the events. So you, in that context, you realize exactly what he means. It is not the way I use that word. And then you think, you go up, you go up further, 1899, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And you realize we mostly understand that in the incorrect way. We think it means the yeah. excellent Wizard of Oz. But what it meant was the astonishing Wizard of Oz. Now, the fact is those semantically, they are distinct, but they're close enough that it's, you can misunderstand it and still kind of, you know, under, you still enjoy the, or more or less use the term without questioning what it means. So I, I, I follow that kind of usage all the time. Words that shift, um, slowly and sometimes uh, all of a sudden. So a word like wonderful, which is used the same way for five, 600 years, and then in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, it suddenly shifts. And now if you were to use it the way it was used on all occasions until about 1930, um, it would seem bizarre and unusual today. So language is always moving and changing. So my point is that uh, another example is the Ivanhoe example of Anglo-Saxon roots versus the, the French roots, right? So <laughs> the, the words of, uh, and you know, just make it very, very brief, the words of, um, of food as it's mm -hmm. served, uh, as opposed to the words uh, of the animals uh, in the barnyard. And so, mm -hmm. for example, pig is, is English, but pork is French. Um, cow is English, but beef is French. Um, uh, veal is English, uh, or calf is English, but veal is French. Um, deer is English, but venison is French. Sheep is English, but mutton is French. So what does that tell you? That tells you that there was an entire society that was serving another one, right? That the group of yeah. people who spoke English in the farmyard were serving the people who spoke French in the chateau, right? So that one group of people conquered another. They were called the Normans, and um, they were the upper class. And so we see embedded in our language that we use every single day an actual class structure. Um, that that uh, was real and violent uh, and political, uh, and uh, and uh, over the course of one thousand years has become simply embedded into our daily life when we order a sandwich. So can I can I uh, horn in here? Sure, please. Um, it it makes me curious about something uh, like when you take something out of the dictionary, is there an active culling? How does that work? And is it archived? Because this is part of the story you're telling now, is how senses go away, they, they die. But I mean, most people think like, you know, neologisms and words that get eliminated, but it's not just that. So can you speak to that some? Yeah, I mean, first of all, in the online dictionary, we tend not to delete anything because there's, you know, there's no limit to the space. So that's one thing. However, space, Space was the number one concern. I, in fact, I, I think you could argue Webster's third, every single style decision except for one uh, uh, was made because of space. They wanted to shoehorn as much information into that book as possible. You know, Merriam-Webster's typesetting um, for the Collegiate Dictionary, I believe is the only book in American publishing that has what's called negative leading. That means that the space uh, the spaces between the lo vertical lines are shorter than the, the, the uh, actual height of the letters because we were trying to make the, the, the book full of information. So yes, in the collegiate, we certainly did drop words. They tended to be the most boring words and they tended to be compound words that are self-evident. So for example, mm -hmm. in, the, in the 11th collegiate, we dropped the word plantsman, which meant gardener. Um, and we dropped the word um, crossbowman, which meant one who wields a crossbow. Um, and so to do that, we saved a couple of lines. And those words are, are archaic. They're used in Shakespeare. Um, and we figured, well, you know, if somebody needs them, they'll be in the big unabridged dictionary and we can make space for them here. We did drop one word that we had to put back in. And that word was, um, I always forget the, the, the word. It was... Um, um, uh, it, it, it meant, it meant, um, hang on, it's funny, I, I, it, 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 it meant an uncouth or undesirable person, an, a mean person, and it, it had been used by President Truman and was quoted quite frequently. I'm sorry, I'm just blanking on it, it'll come to me. Um, and then it never was quoted again, so it kind of faded. And then it was used on TV by a TV Got a TV commentator used it all the time. And so we had to put it back in the dictionary because people were looking the word up. 
um, gosh, I'm just blanking on the, on the word. This, this happens when you work with words all the time. Um, but the basic thing is uh, we don't archive them in any other way except that they're in print in our earlier editions. So they're living forever in that, in that form. Now, I can tell you one other more modern way that, that you imply. Think of a word like vitriolic which today we use only in its metaphorical meaning. And what I mean by that is vitriol, which we understand today to mean, for example, a, a harsh political rhetoric. Uh, but vitriol actually had a concrete meaning, which was uh, hydrochloric acid, which was liquid that burns. So the liquid that burns became metaphorically words that burn, right? And so that was the, that's the metaphor, the operative metaphor. However, almost no one uses the word vitriolic to refer to the scientific chemical compound that makes a liquid that burns you. And so we dropped that meaning from our, um, our uh, learner's dictionary, our ESL dictionary, because that's a scientific meaning, it's a chemical meaning, it's a technical meaning. And you also notice that we've uh, shifted that one to be below the more common rhetorical meaning in our online dictionary today. So if, I hope that makes sense to you, that we will drop mm -hmm. super archaic uh, or technical meanings that are almost never used. Well, that brings up the question of, over time, the Merriam-Webster dictionary will start to resemble the OED more because it'll become more diachronic. It'll have words in it that aren't used to it. Right now, it's pretty well synchronic, isn't it? That's right. Uh, and uh, it's a huge and important distinction. It will and it won't, Jacques, because we are, we're, our mission is always going to be the current active vocabulary of American English. Um, and so it'll, it'll be a thousand years before, <laughs> yeah. before it looks diachronic. Um, and, be, and my point being that there's so much in the OED that is literary that hasn't been used in the last 400 years. Um, and, and basically we make a distinction, a technical distinction between archaic and obsolete. Um, and this, this is about as nerdy as it gets, uh, which is that if a word uh, is not recorded in active use after 1755, that is to say, after the publication of Johnson's Dictionary, which is viewed as the first true, reliable, uh, scientific census of the English language, um, then we mark that word obsolete. If it does have some use after 1755, then we mark the word archaic. And that goes for words that, for example, are only found in prayers, like thee and thou, um, or, or rarely used. I mean, I shouldn't say that, because thee and thou are sometimes used in Quaker tradition and other things. But, um, they're clearly registered as archaic. And so we make that distinction. So obsolete terminology will be found in things like Chaucer, uh, but with no evidence of use at all after uh, the 18th century. So that, that kind of ensures that we're gonna stay synchronic. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So when you mark something as archaic, is it a uh, um, register difference? Well, I mean, that's an important point because archaic, I would call a usage note and usage, as we said before, is the manners of language, right? It, it has to do with the cultural. What I mean by manners is manners is cultural, right? It's, it has nothing to do with the spelling, nothing to do with the meaning or the history, but um, do you, do it, which fork do you pick up? You know, that it's, it, it, that's what usage is. And so archaic will mean that if you're writing for a contemporary audience and you do not wish to convey uh, an old fashioned or literary or technical kind of uh, uh, tone, then this word maybe is not appropriate for, 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 for that particular piece of writing. And in that sense, that's what our usage notes tell you. So for example, the word in a good de descriptive dictionary, the word irregardless is in our dictionary. Now, obviously we don't recommend that you use the word irregardless. It's widely viewed as an error. However, it's found in published writing so frequently that we are required as card-carrying descriptivists to put it in the dictionary. But notice there is a label, there is a, it, it says non-standard. And then we give a little note that simply says use regardless instead. Um, that this is a, a, a frequent mistake for this word. Um, it's maybe a hyper correction. There's a lot of reasons you can think of for this to exist. But the fact is you will be judged. As we said before, people judge each other on their use of language, on the way they sound, the way they spell. And we try to give you warnings in the dictionary to be useful in that way, to say that you will be judged harshly, perhaps, uh, if you use this word in your writing, if your writing is professional or academic. So non-standard is the new uh, yeah. illiterate. Yes. And was there an intermediate stage substandard? 
There was in the old in the old dictionary and in, in Webster second there was substandard non-standard illiterate um, and, and of course we dropped we dropped substandard and non-standard and we dropped uh, illiterate and substandard um, partly because there were so many labels in the old dictionaries that we we ultimately felt that it was it, that was confusing too so we have fewer labels now but some of them are really specific and they're helpful like it'll say something like in italics it'll say baseball. You know that this is a word that's used only in this context. You know the 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 whatever the in, infield fly rule or, or walk off the term walk off. There's a label there that says baseball because it just sets the context so clearly that why not have a usage label that says baseball? You know it just makes it more efficient. Um, but non-standard uh, is the is the term and and then if you go and look up the term non non-standard in the dictionary, it gives an excellent linguistic definition of what that mm -hmm. means, what we mean when we say that. Yeah. And it's not judgmental because it's just saying it's not the standard, whereas yeah. sub is judgmental. Exactly. Can I ask, I've noticed some of the etymologies are getting a lot more relaxed and a lot more interesting. Yes. Um, is, it, can I look forward to more of that? Yes, and I wish we could, I wish our etymologist, I wish we could clone him and make 100 of him because um, he's doing such amazing work. And partly that's because he's got more space. Um, mm. and, and partly, as you, as <laughs> I'll say this, and I'll just pretend that he's not listening, <laughs> um, that it, 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 one sort of axiom about lexicography is that etymologists often disagree. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, our etymologist is, is, is one of, if not the most brilliant person I've ever worked with in my life. And, um, uh, but he has strong opinions. Now, he can always back them up. And we are careful never to say um, something that we don't, uh, that we're not sure of. So there'll there'll be there'll be labels in the etymologies that will say something like probably from mm -hmm. or akin to, um, and those are hedging. And don't forget, there are many etymologies in a Merriam-Webster dictionary that simply say uh, uh, origin unknown. And and in fact, the most dramatic moments in my spelling bee experiences have been when Jacques, when you've had to say origin unknown yeah. uh, about a word in the final, and you hear the entire room a couple of thousand people gasp at once because <laughs> what you realize is the, the clue, uh, the principal source of clues for this word, for this brilliant young speller has been taken away. Uh, yeah. And uh, so now they have to really almost guess. Well, I think uh, if we have one more question, maybe uh, we, we've sure. uh, uh, taken advantage of Peter and uh, his, his willingness, his excitement. Anybody I have a question. Hi. I was just wondering, what was the word that was being defined that spurred adding racism to the dictionary? Uh, you know what? Uh, it, it, now that you say that, I'm going to have to look at the... the it, this is one of those cases where the journalist Ben Zimmer, who's a wonderful linguist who writes for The Atlantic, um, he, when he dives into this, I give him all the material and then he writes it up. So I didn't do the research myself. Uh, he determined, was, I didn't know this, it was, it was, it was added to a, a dictionary of synonyms, not our traditional dictionary, but a dictionary of synonyms that was being drafted at that time. And I believe it was added to an, a, an entry um, uh, grouping it with a bunch of other words. And I can't, it, so it's in the Ben Zimmer. If you Google Ben Zimmer Atlantic racism, um, the whole story will be right there. You can watch, you can read it. Um, and you'll notice the fo photograph that I took of the of the um, slips of the little sl handwritten slips um, uh, of the uh, of the research. But I forget what it was. But it was not actually a dictionary definition. It was a dictionary of synonyms, which we really don't have anymore. And a dictionary of synonyms is different from a thesaurus because a thesaurus tends to be just a list of words, whereas a dictionary of synonyms actually um, uh, discriminates uh, in prose. It explains this word is different from this word because of this. Um, and this word is used more frequently in this context. And so it, it, it's a very dense text. Um, and it's one that I'm, I love, uh, but ultimately it's one that um, has a, a little less um, commercial use. And these days we're working so hard on the, on the dictionary and the thesaurus that the dictionary of synonyms has fallen a little bit back in time. And I, the current one is, uh, the research is, go, goes back a few decades. Um, which is too bad. But when it was being worked on, in this case, in 1938, uh, for maybe the first edition, um, it, that's where they, and so the, the rule in house was, if you use a word in the dictionary of synonyms, then it had to be added to the big dictionary too. Thank you. I'll definitely look that up.
Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And, the, and the, just the notion that racism, and, and it's an important point because the, the idea of sy a systemic racism, think of all the isms. They're all systemic, right? They're, all, you know, socialism, fascism, uh, feminism. They all ref reflect a, a, a societal uh, a, a, a understanding of a phenomenon. None of them, are, almost none of them uh, come from an individual. You know what I'm saying? In other words, to say that racism has its origins in the, the individual hatred of one person for another group um, isn't really good enough because in fact it constitutes this sort of, this, you know, governmental or systemic um, uh, approach to, to something. And all the isms are, are, are abstract, difficult words to define. And, uh, and, 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 and so revisiting them for every generation, for example, is probably a, a good thing to do. So thank you all so much. And it's a treat to see uh, you, Jock. Um, it, it, and I'm sorry I missed <laughs> yeah. you in May. And I hope, I hope we can see each other soon. And also, I, I live uh, not too far from the Vermont border, so I feel a connection to, <laughs> to, to your, to your uh, campus, which I've visited a number of times, and I love it up there.